Hey everyone, I'm really excited about today's episode where I have a great conversation with Donovan Samara Israel, who is a wellness educator and coach at Stanford University. He's been doing that for over 30 years and he brings deep wisdom, really great research, insights into the most cutting edge information around the nervous system, boundaries, positive psychology, meditation, all the things that you know I love to talk about. And so we had a really great conversation and he shares things that are really practical and useful, like micro practices you can use in your daily life as an educator every day while you're driving, while you're walking to the bathroom, whatever it may be. So that I found that really helpful. He talks about things like how to resource your energy on the front end and to recover on the back end so that you have the energy to be great for your students or your community, how to be healthy, selfish, or wise selfish with your self-care, which I thought was really, really fascinating. So check that out. The concept that Brene Brown actually shares that the most boundary people, this is paraphrased, the most boundary people are the most generous and giving people. So we talked about that, which I think you'll love. How your presence is the medicine. Think about that for a second. He shares a teaching around the no sandwich. So how to say no for a lot of us that are empaths and really hard, we're always giving. Like how do we actually say no to people in a way that they can hear? How to fill your buckets. That perfectionism is, that perfectionism is actually the opposite of self-compassion. And then how to redefine this notion of self-care so it's accessible to all of us, whether you're really busy or you have a job like teaching or education where you're in a building or if you work from home or whatever your case may be. But how do we really reimagine what self-care means and ensure that we're taking care of ourselves daily? All right, enjoy the episode. All right, welcome everyone. I'm really excited today to be here with Donovan and I'd love to give him a chance to just kind of share a little bit about himself and help us get to know him a little bit before we launch into our conversation. Great, thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Donovan Samara Yisrael, and I am a well-being uh, educator. Uh, the old school term was health educator, and um, and we just started a coaching program on our college campus, which I think is probably the future. Um, subclinical conversations with uh, students uh, about anything in life that is either weighing them down or areas that they want to. Uh, grow and in increase their capacity to live their best life. Um, so that's been really great. And um, I can talk about that more. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. And I met Donovan at the Stanford Teacher Education Program Alumni Conference. And I felt like he was speaking the same language. And I was like, I got to reach out to him and see if I can get him on, on the podcast. But I really loved what you had to say about, you know, what, what do teachers do? We're in a time right now where teachers are tired, right? It's been a really hard three years. My friends, you know, they've been in education for 20, 25 years, and they're like, this is the worst three years of our life. And I don't think they're being dramatic. Like this has really been a hard time on educators or educators. And I'm just wondering what advice you would give to, you know, the teacher or the principal that is really having a hard time getting out of this kind of survival mode that they're in every day and just, just doesn't know what to do. And they just, they love what they do, but they just can't find their way out. It's just so overwhelming. Yeah, first I'll start by just honoring teachers. I mean, I think teachers are if if we're all if we're all a bunch of iPads and phones in the world, then teachers are downloading the software that make life mm -hmm. livable and uh and, and I really, you know, just honor them. I, I I'm indebted to teachers and I, I think they're saving lives and changing lives on the Absolutely. daily and um yeah, you know, I mean, in some sense, you know, the conversation about about all of, of taking care of ourselves is is somewhat simple. You know, it's it's two R words: uh, resourcing on the front end and recovery on the back end. So if I was running a marathon, I need to resource on the front end and recover on the back end. Um, so that's the basics, and we can dive into that at whatever level you want. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about burnout, you know, I think of it as kind of two. I'll use the metaphor of a candle, or there's kind of two ways to look at it. There's the there's the quantity of work, of course, and and you have to have that managed because basic laws of physics apply, whether you're a physics teacher or not. Basic right. laws of physics apply, and you the quantity if it's too much, 
uh, it, it's, you know, for the 24 hours in a day, which doesn't change and, and eight hours of sleep, then that's a problem. But I think if you yeah. look at the materials around this, it's not just the qual the quantity, it's the quality. So things like autonomy and agency are really important. You know, I think Google did this thing a while back or one of the big companies, they, you know, once a month, you could do whatever you wanted to do, uh, like a, like a passion project. It had to be oh, yeah. technical related, yeah. right? So the, every one Friday of the month, you get to just do whatever you want and it changed things. Um, there are yes. studies, there are studies with the elderly that, if you put plants in their room and you say, don't worry about it, we'll pick the plants and we'll take care of them, there's no effect. If you say, help us pick the plants and you take care of it, there's this massive effect in yes. terms of autonomy and agency. So I think, so when we talk about this, you know, let's talk about not just the quantity of work, because yeah. people actually like to work. Why do you think people retire and then run marathons or That's climb right. mountains, right? We like right. stress. If it's stress we like, we like stress, right? Mm -hmm. We like skiing. We like, you know, paying money to go to a Super Bowl game. We like stress. On the other hand, if it's not stress we like, then it's a problem. And so mm -hmm. let's look at the quantity and the quality of right. that stress. Okay. And then we can start to understand how to manage that so it's in that 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 sweet spot. Um, yeah. So, yeah, tell me about resource and recovery. I really like the marathon analogy. Because I feel like how many times that I, as a teacher here, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? Yeah. And so I love that analogy for educators. And I remember you asking a question in your talk, like, you know, who schedules days off after they've traveled for three days or they've had a big presentation or whatever. And most of the folks in the conference, well, well zero, said they, yeah. they do that. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you is I was like the one person who said I do that. And I don't even really know what I'm doing, but I feel like you're going to tell me there's that's part of the recovery process. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the kind of what a personal trainer will tell you, right, is like you 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 tear your muscles during the workout, but that doesn't build muscle. What builds muscle is when you go to sleep and you had you hydrate and you have your electrolytes and your proteins and then you it all digests and then you're sleeping and now your muscles are repairing themselves. Now you now you get stronger. So we we forget about the digest part. We we eat by the way, this is this is a, a educational kind of theme and metaphor here. You know, students will gorge themselves on the food and then vomit it on the test. But then you ask them a month later, "What did you learn in science class junior year?" They, they don't remember. No idea. Even the next never, day. They, yeah, they didn't digest it. So yeah. we 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 have to digest. Rest and digest is a term I got from Rick Hansen, but. I'm sure he didn't invent it. Rest and digest, rest and digest. Okay. We need, we, we're taking in all this content with a content-based world. We're doing yeah. a podcast right now. We're creating content. You have to, you have to digest it and let it sink mm -hmm. in. And again, this back to Rick Hansen, who, who, whose, whose son has a podcast for us, but like, it's, it's one thing to teach people, you know, meditation, you know, I'll be teaching students all the time. They're like, Donovan. Yeah, I heard that. I know that. It's like, yeah, right. knowing something doesn't mean you've digested it and made it a part of you. I can watch a video on, you know, from Messi playing soccer. That does not make me a, a FIFA World Cup quality soccer player. Right. Like, so knowing something means nothing. You have to, you have to do it. You have to, you have to, you have to learn it. You have to teach it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to behave it and and then download it into your gut and make it a part of you. So. So yeah, that's um, you know a big part of it is that the so the rest the, on the front end you got to think about it as I think about it as what buckets need to be filled for David to have a good week. So right. I, I right. tell people to come up with you know six to ten, not more than that, but buckets that you know obviously the sleep and the the water and the food, but you know it could be it could be live music you know if if you're really a live music person it could be obviously connection has to be on there purpose and meaning has to be on there. But what are the buckets, the batteries that have to be charged to some degree uh, for you to have a good week? And then yeah. that's what weekends are for. Weekends were put there on the on the back end. And I don't just mean, I don't just mean, you know, labor laws, but I mean literally the religions, right? Uh, I mm -hmm. used to be a Christian. I'm I'm Jewish now, and we have the Sabbath and Shabbat because because even the ancients knew that you had to have a day off. God had a day off, right? Right. So right. You have to have that recovery time, you know, 
on the back end. So, so, so what we say is don't worry about stress so much, although it has to be in the range of doable, of course. Right. But, but, but if you're, if you have the resourcing on the front end, your, your buckets or batteries are, are charged or full to not perfectly, but you know, to 60, 70%. Yeah. And then on the back end, you have that time to rest and recover. Um, you should be doing okay. Right. Yeah. This is so fascinating. And, you know, I, I graduated from the Stanford teacher school that we talked about, and that is in, it, in and of itself, it's almost impossible to do what you just said, because it's a one-year, it's a two-year program that's jammed into one year, right? <laughs> so then I went straight into teaching at Oakland Public Schools, and that was like the most overwhelming thing I ever experienced. Not the students, I always say this, not the students, the system, right? The adults, like the low expectations and the, the fighting and all that. And it was like, it was like a, a, a stress zone and like a nervous system activation zone, right? It's, it's like a war zone. I mean, they've done research, right? PTSD in urban schools. And, and then I went into a growing charter school that was like growing and super high expectations. And, and it's like, I did that for what, 10 years and then realized, wow, I haven't recovered at all. You know, yeah. like I don't take vacations, kind of take some break in the summer, but summer was just time. I get actually the summer was the recovery time. Yes. I would just sleep for like six weeks straight, but that's not yeah. healthy. Right. Like you're literally and then it's ready to go again. Right. And so I wonder for teachers, like, how do they how do they handle this? Because I feel like they're they could be thinking, well, yeah, that's great if you get to, you know, work from your home or have a flexible schedule. But like I'm a teacher, I'm in I'm in the building from seven to five every day or I'm a principal. You know, how do we how do we help them? Yeah. So let me just back up and say, you know, I'm not you know, I think sometimes when we do workshops on well-being and self-care. Yeah. We don't take in, you know, community care and the system in, involved. And I, I want to be very clear, I'm not blaming the teacher if they're not well, because yeah. the, sy the systems are oppressive. And, you know, I think didn't, weren't there just a, uh, in the time that we're recording this podcast, just yesterday or the day before, there was a massive protest uh, in schools in uh, Los Angeles and I think another county. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think I want to be clear that when we talk about this, a lot of people in the world are in oppressive systems and they don't have control and they, they have to do what they have to do to put food yeah. on the table for their kids. And so I want to yeah. honor that. And, and, yeah. but, but the question is, do, do we have power and, and can we, you know, uh, use that power in, in, as individuals and in groups to push back yeah. and to say, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. Or I'm going to be, I'm going to teach part-time or right. I'm going to, you know, uh, um, use my power and, and galvanize that power to push back to, yes. to get these needs met. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sound like, oh, just go do this and it's your fault. Right. You <laughs> no, no, no. The systems are oppressive. And, and um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about, you know, um, of, of boundaries. So a lot, one thing yeah. I talk a lot about is boundaries that, yeah. that we love the kids and, and we take them to bed with the, you know, we take them, you know, we can't, we can't sleep at night because we take the, the, the stress and the, the traumas and the things that we're hearing about. And so, so one of the things I teach is also, you know, how to put the bar down. I have this workshop mm -hmm. on compassion, right. How to put the bar down um, nice. because you are running many marathons at once and tomorrow morning is another, you know, sprint or marathon. And true. true. And if you're staying up till four in the morning thinking about a kid because they're going through some serious stuff, that's, I, I get it, but you also have to serve 25 other kids tomorrow morning. Right, right, right. And so, so boundaries are a big part of that. And it's painful. I mean, I get, again, these are, these are very technical types of skills. They're right. spiritual and emotional skills, but, but, you know, people say, but Donovan, I don't want to abandon the kid, you know, because you're not abandoning them. You if you're a doctor and you're 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 in a war zone in the Ukraine and you have to go on to the next patient, you're not abandoning that person. Right. You're doing your best to serve them and you've got to move on because there are other people coming in. Yeah. And so really having some rationale and some way of holding that, that you know, I have to go to bed now because I have my own kids, I have my own body, and I have other kids I need to serve tomorrow. And I have to put down the bar now. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a weightlifting uh, movement oh, in, yeah. for the podcast yeah. because you have to put the bar down and yes, and those boundaries are huge and you have to push. And then back to the industry, you know, the, the, um, the school, you have to push back against, you know, the, the things that they're trying to, to make you do, because I'll just say one more thing. 
you know, we abuse our high performers. We abuse yes. our high performers. Yes. You know, and, and I mean all of them. I, I even mean, you know, Taylor Swift and Beyonce, like, and, and football mm-hmm. players and soccer players, you know, you look at them later in life and they, you know, they have addictions and they they have their football players for sure, right? With all the injuries. So yeah. we abuse our high performers and teachers don't even have the benefit of getting paid well before, while we abuse them, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Beyonce at least gets paid well when we abuse her, right. you know, you let her dance and do 400 shows a year. And so that we can have fun. She at least gets paid well. Teachers don't even get paid that well. And we abuse them. So, so I yeah. guess, you know, finding ways to not let the industry abuse you would be. Yeah. I love this way of framing it. And I love that you really brought up the fact that like, obviously people are in oppressive systems and this can get very like white dominant culture, you know, like, oh, self-care and meditation and spa yeah. day and all this stuff. So I'm really glad you you named that and it's out there. And I feel like I really agree with you that you are, you do have the power and you are empowered to set the boundaries and to kind of decide how you want to, within the structures you're, you're working with, you know, pushing back or just working within the structures. So, you know, I stop work at five, whatever, you know, I have to stop. One of the things I always notice and people would remark to me, they'd say like, you don't seem like the other high performers because, you know, going to step and then going into these uh, different charter schools, it was like everybody, what it was, it was the 1% of high performers, you know, everyone had the Ivy league degree and, and I, they would always say, you don't seem like one of the, one of us. <laughs> what they were saying is that I actually knew how to set boundaries. Mm. And I actually understood mm-hmm. that, you know, mm-hmm. there was more to life than, than getting this yeah. done. And I remember a story one time when I was doing a big unit with an English teacher, I was a history teacher and we were collaborating and we were, we were like meeting the, you know, at five 30 after school for the next day's lesson. And she's like, if we just stay and like, get this one thing, right. You know? So we ended up staying for like three more hours to like eight o'clock, which I would have left at like five Oh five. And I actually assessed the lesson from this lens. I said, did that extra three hours increase the learning outcomes by like, you know, 20% or whatever the extra time I had given. And I'm like, no, it, it probably increased it by about 3%. And then to your point, I was more tired the next day. I was less engaged and I wasn't quite as present for the kids. So I feel like right. it's really important as the individual within the oppressive system that you understand where your lane is and your boundary and know which industry you're in. If you're a teacher in a school, it's very different than somebody working from home, right? There's different parameters, different boundaries, but I think that you have the power to create your own structures and boundaries within your own life as much as possible. Right. And I feel like that and making that choice and getting clear, like I'm going to take care of myself is a very, is a very difficult choice for teachers and educators because we're typically empaths and we want to give everything to everyone else. And we don't actually know how to prioritize our own self and our own, you know, loving ourselves and caring for ourselves because we think we're abandoning the kid and we think we're, you know, not giving to the people. And, And it, I feel like that's one of the biggest issues that I see. Yeah, and, and and just to speak to that quickly, because you brought up a lot of really good points there with that story. Um, yeah. One thing is that, you know, it, it's so compassion is about decreasing suffering in it as as to the largest degree for the whole system. The problem yeah. is that you call them you know, teachers empaths, they they have empathy, but then mm-hmm. there's a whole nother can of worms there, by the way. And <laughs> okay. empathy and compassion. So we'll get there. <laughs> but let's let's just leave it where it is. But like okay. So, so they have the kids in the circle. They have the parents in the circle. They have their own kids. They have the dog in the circle. The one person yeah. that's not in their circle of compassion is themselves. Yes. And, and, and so it's like, what if you're the hub of the wheel, which you are? Yeah. And what if you're actually the most important person in your circle because yes. so many people rely on you? So then shouldn't you? It's not selfish. And, and if it is, we call it wise selfish or we call it healthy selfish. Yes. Shouldn't you then be healthy selfish and wise selfish to say, I, a lot of people rely on me. I need to be really selfish and really, yes. you know, you know, uh, religious about my stopping at five or whatever. So that's, that's one thing is, is, and so if I was coming into a classroom, you know, of teachers, I would, I would have them focus on their own suffering and increase their own compassion for self because they're so selfless that they, 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 they'll take the, the, the kids suffering home with them and, and not yes. put it down. But then they, they completely, their bladder is full. They haven't peed in three hours and they don't even notice. So we yes. don't even, we don't have the same empathy for ourselves. Yes. So, so, so that's one thing you would want to increase it and see it 
And yeah. we, we literally do, when we do self-compassion, we have them imagine themselves as a little child because, because it's very hard for them to have compassion for themselves as an adult. Yeah. But then when they imagine little Anita or little Jonathan, then they go, yeah, that kid deserves compassion Absolutely. and they can start yeah. to build. So that's what compassion practice. I would bring compassion practice to all schools. There are compassion, you know, there's compassion at schools and they do compassion practice for the students, but I think we should do them for the teachers, the superintendents, yes. the principals, as well as any frontline workers like, like ER docs and absolutely police officers and firefighters. We don't teach compassion and it's like sending a military people to the front lines without, without any protection. Uh, absolutely. At all. So um if I can, the other thing that you brought up was yeah. So step students, particularly high achieving students, I want to I want to comment on that. The example you gave, the story you gave about staying late in three hours, right? What do we know? Like the difference between an A minus and A plus is like double the time. So okay. so just knowing that. So knowing that, like, what if an A minus is perfectly awesome, and we don't <laughs> need to spend another eight hours to make it an A plus? Because it's right. just not worth it. It's, uh, you yeah. know, what do they call it? In business school, they call it uh, law of diminishing returns, right? Law of okay. diminishing Okay. So we can just say, no, it's perfect. Now, the other thing about that is when you talk to, when I talk to step students, they say, it's time to stop getting, to stop getting straight A's in your classroom. And like you said, why don't you turn in a B minus paper? And I, I know Ira and I know Madi and I know, you know, uh, Ruth Ann and those guys. And I'll tell them your program is, is it's sadly a burnout program that's teaching people to be into a burnout field. So right. Stanford needs to stop. And I don't know why they don't, but they just won't. So, <laughs> so, and I'll tell them that, yeah. but like in your example, yeah, let's not get an eight, you know, that teacher, I would want to ask them if we stay for another three hours, we can really, is that a perfectionistic student who wants to turn in an A plus, you know, on paper, you know, uh, lesson plan, but then wake up, tired and then implementation of the Western lesson plan kind of sucks because you're yeah. like exhausted. That yeah. doesn't make any sense. I would rather right. have you have a good enough lesson plan because you're an awesome teacher and that teacher's an awesome teacher. Have a 60%, 70% good enough lesson plan and show up rested yes. and now implement that 60% lesson plan, but be on fire. Yes. Right? It doesn't seem like there's a way, oh, as I'm reflecting on this, amazing teacher that I worked with there wasn't an awareness within her and there wasn't an awareness within the paradigm and the culture we were in so the the thought was we have to do excellence we have to be excellent for the students we're changing the trajectory of their lives since our low-income students like we have to give it our all right and so that was yeah. which obviously has tons of benefits right right it, it does right because we are changing the trajectory and we would you know give them rides homes and give them ride home give yeah, a ride yeah. home and and meet with go to their quinceaneras and like all these amazing things we would do. Yes. Yes. We didn't know when to stop. Right. And that's where it goes too far. And I feel like yeah. first step is having the awareness that you're actually going down that path. But like just recognizing that feels like is really important. And then having a system or at least a, a school culture where people are actually talking about it. Like it was never talked about at step. It was never talked about any job I've ever had, you know, oh, passion practices. Or, it's just not even something we talk about. Well, and, and look, just just to back to your, that's really meaty. So going to quinceanera, so one one of the things I learned from the grief world is the the most like important sentence is your presence is the medicine. Your presence mm. is the medicine. Yes. So 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 if we use that as our value, staying up three hours with the two of you in the classroom writing some stuff down on a piece of paper that the students will never see, right. is that is that is that useful and helpful? No. Going to the quinceanera, which by the way, you get to eat some food, you get to be in the presence, you get to be so much fun. <laughs> It's so much fun. So, so if I had the choice, then yes, go to, you know, stop working on this paper that you guys are writing. You're not students anymore. Put it away. Yes. You guys, you guys know it now. You spent time, you spent until eight, you know it. And, and often, I'm a presenter. So I say, Donovan, do you know the material? Is it good enough? Yes. And yes. now because I took improv and because it's all about the, the, the performance in the moment, yeah. I just have to have it that downloaded. And now yeah. I have to be on point in the moment to yes. access it. Yes. So if you, if you knew that you guys would have been like, Hey, let's go to dinner together even. And yeah. let's, let's, <laughs> let's love on each other. And then let's go home to our families, get some sleep. And now let's implement the B minus curriculum in an awesome way. 
Yes. So, so again, yes. these are the kinds of things if I was to work with teachers to go, oh, if I have to make choices, what are the most prudent choices I'm making right. with right. the amount of time? And yeah. then at the end of the day, you may not be able to go to every quinceanera because you're like, okay, yeah. now I had a death in the family or I'm exhausted. I'm going to have to grieve right now because that's one of my favorite students. But I went to three quinceaneras in the last month yeah. and I have to say no to this one. Yeah. And, and yeah. now I employ grief to mm -hmm. say, I just can't go. Yeah. And, maybe, and maybe somebody else on my team can go and they can videotape yeah. and I can watch it later. And that's good yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, it's really, and I feel like I'd be curious what you think about this. To me, boundaries really come down to self-love, meaning that yeah. I love myself enough to say no to somebody else. And, you know, as teachers and educators, we're just giving all the time. Yeah. Saying no is like, it's not even, I remember my first year as a teacher and my cooperating teacher said, just say no to everything they say for the first three months. Just yeah. try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the best advice he ever gave me because I never said no to anybody. And they'd yeah. be like, oh, can I go do it? Can I do this? Can I do the paper late? Can I, and then I can I just do my homework? And I'd always be like, no, no. And it's like so liberating and empowering because I had never yeah. said no my whole entire life. And yeah. all of a sudden I'm saying no to all these teenagers. And then I noticed after three months that they would expect me to say no. But then when I did say yes, they'd be like, oh, this like this this must be a good, like we should actually ask this question. This seems like a thoughtful question. Maybe you know. So, but it's just the the point I'm making is it's a funny story. But the point I'm making is that we don't know how to say no. Yep. Because we don't know how to say no because we don't love ourselves in a way to really honor our own you know our own journey. Yeah, this is so juicy. You know, so so I love what Brene Brown says about the the most generous people are the most boundaried people, mm -hmm. uh, and that's paraphrased. But you know. It's kind of contra it's kind of like non-intuitive, right? Yeah. But if, but if you think about it, a person who has good boundaries is able to be thoughtful about what they say yes to and resource themselves. And then when it's something that they either enjoy doing or or th then they say then they're able to say yes to it. Like I just said no to somebody asked me to be on a board of our synagogue again. And I was yeah. like, I am not a board member. Now, if you want <laughs> me to come and do workshops on right. wellness, I will show up every night of the week because I love it. I, yeah. I can give that board yeah. meetings. I don't have energy. So qualitatively, you give the things that you have energy for. So that's one thing. And then quantitatively, you, you resource yourself and then say yes. So by the way, so one of the things we can talk about now, if you want to just teach a skill in your podcast is, yes. is the, the no sandwich. We, we, I teach this thing called the no sandwich. We can talk about okay. that. Yeah. But yes. Every yeah. teacher must be able to practice boundary setting to protect their precious resources, yes. right? Even as resources in our world are so, the, the dams are finally full of water, energy, solar energy. We need to, pr we need to protect our resources and then, and then meet them out thoughtfully so that we're able to meet the needs and say no when we have to. And then there's grief for that because it, it is sad for us to say no, but we, yeah. we have grief for yeah. that. So the no sandwich is basically, you know, uh, the, the, the no is the bread, the meat or, or the, the whatever, the tomatoes, whatever vegetarian yeah. option. And then the, the, <laughs> the, on either side of it, you say something positive to reaffirm the relationship. Mm, so, yes. so you say, yes. so David, you know, God, you look great today. It's so good to see your smile. And I'm so glad that you contacted me about your podcast. I would never say no to your podcast, by the way, but let's say I wanted to say <laughs> no to your podcast. So, and say, but you know what? Um, you know, I can't do, I can't do your podcast uh, this weekend. By the way, don't counter offer if you don't, if you really can't come through. If, if I want to say to you, you know what? Next weekend works for the podcast. If I can do that, do it. But do not counter offer if you do not want to do that because right. they, they will take you up on it. If, if you ask me to yeah. come out your garage and I'm like, I'll do it next weekend and, and I'm go, oops, you know, because you, you're <laughs> like, oh yeah, next weekend works, you know. So, so you say something positive at the front end. God, your hair looks great, or you know, how's the family? You, you know, I'm so excited to see you. Um, no, with yeah. with qualifications or not. And then and then at the end you say, you know, hey, but if you want to go get a Starbucks or you want to go for a walk, I I, I you know, the, the the spring is here. I'd love to go yeah. hiking with you. Yeah. So you said something positive at the end. And, and teachers great. need to practice this yes. uh, in their personal life and their professional life. And I love, what, I love what your teacher did to you or your mentor said, say no to everything in the first three months. Um, other people might say, actually say yes to things in the first three months, 
but then yeah. practice it later because you want to get all those early experiences just to get to know right. the culture. Because exactly. um, I with Frosh, with students at Stanford, I say, do everything your Frosh year, take very few units and do ah. everything your Frosh year. But then sophomore year and junior year, you want to start uh, pruning. You want to start yeah. pruning. That's smart. You know, going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about self-care because I feel like, so I always joke in the podcast that growing up poor and, you know, first generation, generation college student, I always thought of self-care as like rich ladies in Beverly Hills yeah. growing up in Southern California. Like, I'm like, I don't have time for that. I don't even know what that is. And so one of my missions in life is like re, you know, reimagine, yeah. say this, when this word is said, somebody who didn't grow up with, you know, access and power is not immediately shut down. Like, I don't have time for that. To your yeah. point, working in an oppressive yeah. system or whatever it may be. So yeah. I always like to say like self-care, let's let's really expand the definition. Yeah. It's not just going to the spa in Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs> There's way beyond that. Yes. And like, what does it mean for teachers, you know, like for, for busy professionals? Avocado face masks are not the limit of self-care. Um, <laughs> exactly. cu- cucumber eye patches or whatever. <laughs> so, so yeah. So like a very simple way to reframe it is, you know, do I care for myself? Do I, do I literally care about myself? So one, so back to your point of self-love, do I care for my, about myself and do I show it in behavior? Yeah. Because if I, if I love live music and I haven't been in five years, if I love camping and I haven't been in five years, if I haven't slept in three years, am I behaving in a way that shows that David cares for David, Donovan cares for Donovan? Yeah. So, and it's very simply resourcing. Uh, is there food in the refrigerator? Is yeah. my phone charged? Like, yeah. would you would you ever use a phone that was had no battery charge in it? You're like talking on a phone that doesn't have any charge. So it's a very, in some sense, it's absolutely the most simple thing. Is yeah. my Tesla charged? Is there gas in the tank? Is there food in the refrigerator? It's the most simple thing. And then in the more emotional sense, do I care for David and Donovan and do I show it? Mm-hmm. And and then if I don't, if if I don't, I need to go to a you know a, a compassion retreat and ask a question. How come I care about all these other first gen kids? Yeah. But you just, I think you just told me you were a first gen low yeah. income kid. So yeah. how come that first gen low income kid named David, who, yes, is now older and has a degree and has been a teacher and has a podcast, but why doesn't he deserve love and care and compassion? Yeah. We're going to leave him out and leave yeah. him on the side of the road. Is that okay? Yeah. You know, well, I, a lot of times I'll ask people, it's like my little trick when I'm doing coaching and, and workshops and stuff. I'll say like, can you pick your favorite student that you love on the most? Yeah. yeah. And can you pretend like you're them? And just yeah. for one day, treat yeah. that yourself the way you treat that kid. And they're like, oh my God. And then it tricks them into doing it because I love they it. feel like, I love oh, it. well, I love that kid so much. And then they realize that they, they actually aren't practicing, you know, self-love or self-care on themselves. Yeah. I, and I, I go to the absurd and I'm kind of rude. So um, now imagine you have that kid that you love and you just give them the best service. You stay up all night, do all this thing. And then next to them is little you. So little David, little Anita, Susie, whatever. And now you just look at them and go, yeah, no, you don't, you don't deserve it. You don't get it. You don't, you don't get the good stuff. I'm going to yeah. leave you out. Yeah. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to close the door in the classroom. It's raining outside. I'm yeah. giving Starbucks to all the other kids and you're sitting outside on the bench. Yeah. It's, that's Why would you do that? Why would you do that to you? Yeah. And it's, it's so hard, but like, they'll, they'll probably start crying when you, when you, we do the, when they're hearing this, oh, yeah, because, it's because that is exactly how selfless people. Oh, by the way, just a plug for the book, Give and Take by Adam Grant. Okay. It really, it's about, it's more Silicon Valley based, but, but it's really about how the, the, the ultimate uh, recipe or balance of giving and taking for successful people. Oh, okay. And, and a lot of, a lot of us learned, you know, I don't know if it's, it's the, you know, Judeo Christian, you know, mother martyr, you know, mother Mary, but like, I have a mother martyr, you know, like we learn that you abuse yourself to give cookies and this is my mom and yeah. balloons to everybody else on their birthday. Yeah. But then, but then when I have a moment with my mom, she's crying because her, she brought, you know, she brought all her immigrant ancestors here and now they 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 now that they have their five bedroom house in Elk Grove, they yeah. forgot about her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even though she was, my dad and her were on the typewriter, you know, immigration papers back in the sixties and seventies, oh, yeah. and to bring them here, the mother martyr, you know, sacrifices themselves. And yeah. and 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 I don't begrudge that. I think it's beautiful in some sense. 
but resentment is the cost of that and yes. self-abuse is the cost of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so how can we unlearn and look, I tell people, David, and I said this to the step students, I'm selfish as hell. Like I got to have my good coffee. I got to have, you know, my night, my, I love to skate in San Francisco. I love to, you know, have good food and, and good experiences because on Monday morning, I want to, I want to feel like Donovan got good stuff. So I'm ready to serve. Yes. I'm ready to yes. serve. I'm, so I'm selfish on the weekends and, and loving, loving on my family. And, and by the way, I mean, I'm overstating it. I'm donating blood this weekend. So I'm li literally donating parts of my body this weekend. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an organ donor. I gave my kidney to my cousin, wow. you know, so, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a mother martyr too. I literally give body parts away. <laughs> But I'm also selfish as hell. I'm going to eat that yeah. cookie that they gave me at the blood bank, you know? And both can be true, which is I love. Yeah. Both, both can be true at the same time. Yeah. Because yeah. like Brene Brown, the most boundary people are the most selfless. I pick up cigarette butts when I'm coming back from donating blood. But I'll be darned if I'm not going to, you know, ha watch a movie with my wife, have a, a good quality beer on the weekend. Yeah. And, 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 and go to, I might, I might go to a Depeche Mode concert this weekend. <laughs> nice. So like I'm selfish, but, but on Monday morning, I'm ready to give of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's not something that is part of our paradigm, right? Because what we're, if you, if you dig in on the belief system, the belief system is that taking care of yourself is selfish. Yeah. Right. And so if you think about people that go into education, they typically are the helpers, you know, people are going to healthcare, like they want to help others and for them to take. And it's funny when you were talking about the kind of teacher martyr situation, you didn't call it that, but now you said mother martyr. And I was thinking yeah. about some of the guests that I've interviewed really work closely with moms and they say the same things that you, you know, they say the yeah. same things you're saying about moms that you were saying about teachers, right? It's like you're giving, 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 and yeah. you're resentful, but it's not even something that People, like I said, there's not even in the paradigm, it's not even in their yeah. awareness to think like, take care of myself. Like I was working with a group yesterday at school in South Dakota and somebody there shared that this is the first time in her whole entire life as an adult that's, you know, raised and now has adult children that she said, I spend 10 minutes based on my workshops, just sitting quietly and taking care mm -hmm. of myself. That was revolutionary for her. Mm -hmm. So it's changed for a whole entire life. We've, we've only been together for a month and yeah. I'm only doing it. I'm not even doing yeah. it in person, right? It's on zoom, but that small little act yeah. of valuing herself for 10 minutes a day has changed her life. Yeah. But that's like such a big deal for her. It didn't even occur to her. And, you know? and so I want to answer your question about, so I, I, I shared a link to a document, which you can share with your, your listeners that okay. has, it's an acrostic and, you know, A through Z of 26, what I call micro practices from well-being okay, and positive psychology. Most of these things, other than sleeping, you can do while you're standing in line at Starbucks waiting for your, oh, to amazing. order your coffee. So okay. a lot of people think it takes a lot of time. So uh, another, just before I, you know, anything that you do with intention and attention, uh, intention and attention is self-care. So I, I'm, I'm on, for those who are listening, I have some lotion in my hands. I, I squeezed out a little lotion and I'm going to, I'm going to breathe right now and take three deep breaths while I put this lotion on my hands, which is an act of love from, I, I do a lot of stuff with my hands. I, I fix bikes for fly students uh, on campus and, and I've got a lot of oil and cracks in my hands. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving on myself. I'm taking three deep breaths, which is the time it takes for our central nervous system to get the message that we're actually safe and to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. So that takes 10 seconds. And I did some lotion and some breathing. This is something every teacher does have time for. Uh, after going to the bathroom, after going to the bathroom, uh, you know, even as the bell is ringing, they can be waving at students as they come in, putting some lotion on their hands and breathing, closing their eyes and saying, you know, and then calling upon a beautiful, wise guide. I'm, I'm showing a picture of Grogu, baby, baby Yoda right now. Yeah. So maybe, maybe they're, maybe they're, they're CT from step who they, who they really are indebted to, who, who, who taught them how to be a good, and they, and they imagine Mrs. Jones over their shoulder. They're, you know, like Luke Skywalker and, and Yoda or, uh, uh, 
you know, Moana and, and her grandma Tala. They call upon the strength of, of, of that teacher. And they and then and then they're ready to start class, you know. So yeah. these are things. Uh, uh, retreats are amazing, and spas are great. Let's be clear about that. For people who love spas and massages and getting their nails That's done, great. yeah, do that for yourself. Yeah. But during the workday, we want to. You want to know that you can do these things interspersed. Yes. It takes one minute, thirty seconds, ten minutes, like your your student says. To and 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 the science of it is that they're integrating their mind. The right. the at least three players in their mind, their their fear based mind, their their achievement based mind, and and their uh their their family or 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 uh, recovery based mind, the soothing system, the mammalian caregiving system, all can come together. Within ten seconds, they start to integrate again, and now you are you are the you what what Rick Hansen would say is when you have the integrated mind. You are as creative as you can be in that moment. You are as compassionate as you can be in that moment. Um, and you are as intelligent as you can be in that moment. And when you are disintegrated, oh, now we know where road rage comes from. Now yes. we know we're snapping at our kids. We're disassociated. We're disintegrated. Right. Um, and I don't care how good your, your, uh, your lesson plan is, if right. you're disintegrated, you're not going to be a good teacher that day in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're kind of coming up on the, the end of time here, but I wanted to just to kind of wrap up and, you know, is there anything else you wanted to share that maybe you're like, oh, this is really something that I want, you know, educators in the trenches to hear as we wrap up today. Yeah. So, you know, um, self-compassion, I think comes to mind, you know, when, uh, when I'm when I'm teaching about relationships, I start by saying, let's talk about the most important skill, learn to apologize, because you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> yes. So in the world of self-care, I would say there's a lot of things, you know, obviously sleep is really important. And there's, you know, we could go on and about the power of water and, you know, right. and, and breathing. Okay. Yeah. But w- the 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 apology analogy for for life is that life is going to be hard and you're going to make mistakes and life is going to hurt, you know. So the go-to is self-compassion. And I, I always recommend that people go and look up uh, Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, oh, and yeah. Tar- Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H, like the, like the, the cheap candies we used to eat when we were kids. Yeah. Um, and, and learn self-compassion because no matter what you do in life, life is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna have its little injuries. It's a full contact sport. You're gonna hurt yep. yourself. Yep. And there's there's a lot of emotional first aid by the way there's another another resource a guy named Guy Winch G U I W I N C H talks about emotional first aid mm-hmm. but i would say the most general form of emotional first aid is self compassion so yes. life life sucks right now i got a parking ticket i got a flat tire i i i lost it with a kid or my partner um or or one of my kids is suffering how can i kind of this let's let's put the metaphor of the storm like last night the storm is going overhead. Mm-hmm. How can I, you know, warm up a cup of tea, hot chocolate, wrap a warm blanket of self-compassion around myself and love myself through the storm? So yes. I think that that's one of the biggest things. I, I suspect that the mother martyr teachers also beat themselves up when, yes. they, when they can't be everything for everybody, when right. they aren't perfect. Um, and, and by the way, self-compassion is the opposite of perfectionism. For all you step students, sadly, you got into step because you're a, a lot perfectionist. So we yeah, need to start to true. set that aside. We need to set yeah. aside perfectionism and and take on a self-compassion mindset, which is a lot good enough mindset. Yes. Good enough, good enough, good enough. And I'll, I, I know I'm going on here, but let me leave, okay. let me leave one last thing that... I've had on my mind since the beginning of our conversation. Please, teachers out there, we're in award season right now. It's springtime. Please, you're high achieving. Don't be trying to win no awards. You know, don't be trying to win awards. I want you to be able to say no to have boundaries and to serve from a full bucket, to put your oxygen mask on first and serve. And if from that you have a 30-year career where someone decides to give you an award, great. But in the meantime, I want you to be a mediocre plus teacher who's changing lives. Yes. 
Amen. You know? <laughs> everybody thinks they're an above average driver. Really? How can everybody, <laughs> how can 90% of people be above average drivers? I would love everybody to just be a mediocre plus driver. Yes. And that's good enough, bro. Just don't hurt anybody. <laughs> but but be that mediocre plus teacher and 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 change lives and teach something and go get a good night's sleep yes. and have a good weekend and have a 30-year career. And yes. let the awards take care of themselves. Yes. I love it. I love it. So much good stuff today. I knew we'd have a great conversation. I'm so excited. We got to spend some time together. And is there a place where people can find more out, of, out about you? If they want to learn more. I, I, first of all, we'll put whatever you mentioned. You mentioned tons of great resources. We'll put them in the show notes. But if people want to learn more about you or, or connect with you, is there a place where they could go? Um, so I'm, I'm not great with social media and those types of things. And I, I mainly serve, uh, the, the community on campus, yeah. but, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I would love to, um, folks like you who can put me in front of teachers. I will be honest with you. I used to do stuff with Roni Habib's, um, e- emotional e- uh, EQ program, yeah. uh, where he would do conferences on emotional intelligence for teachers. Yeah. I don't know if he was step or not, but he was Palo Alto, uh, gun high school, okay. um, I love teachers. I love presenting for teachers. So if you and others can put me in front of teachers, that's probably the coolest thing. Um, I also love to have coffee. So if if teachers want to invite me out to coffee, I will work for a cup of coffee. So (laughs) you can put them in touch with me through my email address and so forth. Okay, perfect. All right, great. Well, thanks so much, Donovan. It's been a great conversation and uh, we'll talk to you soon. You're very welcome. And I'm honored that you trust me uh, with, with with your time and with your audience. Thanks, David. Thank you.